Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Party Network. My guest today is Sarah Killingsworth. She's a Northern California-based conservation photographer and a wildlife educator with Project Coyote, or Coyote, a frequent public speaker about coexistence with wildlife. Her photo- photography has been published in both local and national media, in print and online. You can check out her photos on IG at Sky Wild. S- oh, sorry, I'll start over. IG at SK Wildlife Photos or at www.sarah, S-A-R-A-H, killingsworth.com. So first off, thank you for your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm happy to be here. So let's talk about bobcats. Um, Who are they? Um, Who are they? Who are they? Uh, Bobcats are amazing animals. They are the most widespread wild cat uh, in North America. They are in all of the contiguous 48 states. They actually range from uh, southern Canada all the way down into Mexico. They are elusive, enigmatic, stealthy hunters with beautiful coats, uh, rarely seen by most people, but um, attract a lot of uh, attention and intrigue when people see them. So bobcats are uh, medium-sized predators. Sometimes people think of them as large, but actually they're only slightly larger than a house cat. So in California, for example, males average 20 pounds and females average 14 pounds. There are actually 12 species, uh, subspecies of bobcats in the U.S., and they have regional variations in the patterns on their coats and their sizes. Bobcats are solitary and territorial, so they um, will come together to mate and the females raise the young alone, but otherwise they each have individual territories, which are typically, and it varies by area, but typically anywhere between three and five miles for a male and one to three miles, those are square miles for a female, but they can be as large as 70 square miles. Bobcats are found in, um, typically people would think of them as being found in habitats like grasslands, mixed brush, um, forested areas where they can easily find their prey, which tends to be small mammals or birds. Uh, But bobcats have actually adapted amazingly well to uh, the suburban and urban push in this country. And so they're found in suburban and urban areas like places like Dallas, Texas, and suburbs in California and Ohio. Uh, so they've, they've managed to find a way to continue to exist even as humans continue to push into their habitat. So you said something about regional, about subspecies, and I'm just mm-hmm. curious, what's the, like, what would make the difference on size? Is it, is it as it gets warmer, they get smaller or as they live in a desert with fewer prey perhaps they get smaller or how how does what are the differentiations yeah that's a great question so uh, typically where it's colder so that can be based on either altitude or um, latitude they tend to be um, larger and have thicker coats um, to deal with the cold and the need to um, have basically heat efficiency and warmth and you said the word elusive, and I was I was thinking in the hours up to this interview, I was thinking I see multiple bears every day, and I see foxes oh, fairly often, and I see raccoons and possums fairly often. And where I live, I have um, seen bobcats maybe twice, and. I mean, that does that sound about right to you? Yeah, it's um, it's one of the things. So bobcats are my favorite. I love wildlife in general, but bobcats are my favorite animal. And it's really interesting. There is so much scientific research and literature on so many different species and species of predators. Uh, bobcats are actually really hard to study even. And so there's far fewer studies of bobcats and people just they see them far less often than many of the other animals, even though they're probably there. And that's a combination of a couple of different things. Bobcats have incredibly good 
hearing and vision. And so they tend to see humans and perceive our presence long before a person notices them. And so because they tend to be skittish, they disappear before the person who's near them even knows that they were there. The other reason is that even if they don't decide um, that they're going to move away, if they see a person, they will immediately crouch down and lie flat in the grass. Um, and their spotted coat makes it such that they they borderline disappear. And I've spent hundreds of hours with bobcats. And I've seen a bobcat in a field and walked along, you know, a fence line or something to change the angle from which I'm viewing the bobcat. And I will literally lose it, even though I knew it was there five five seconds before, but I've I've taken my eyes off it. So it's literally the kind of thing where if you see a bobcat and you look away, it can glide into the brush, it can lie flat in the grass, and the next thing you know, you don't see it at all, even though it's there. So it's a combination of their ability to camouflage themselves in their environment and the fact that they're hyper aware of their surroundings and very skittish of humans, frankly, for good reason. Uh, we're the biggest threat to bobcats um, in this country. You know, honestly, okay, so when I was a kid, I grew up in Colorado and I remember seeing a bobcat at night. Um, uh, we were driving and stopped and somebody shined a flashlight out the window and happened to catch it. So that's one. Mm. And then the times I've seen them more recently, honestly, I mean, I kind of lied when I said I've seen a couple of bobcats. The truth is um, I have seen I've seen them by their eyes reflecting at night. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if I did not had I not had a light, I would not have been able to see them because, of course, the eyes are really shining brightly in the dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the tapetum lucidum. It's such a fascinating thing that, you know, depends on the eye structure of the animals and um, cats have different vision than other mammals. Um, in fact, bobcats have six to eight times the number of rod cells in their retinas. So rod cells are the things that are activated in low light. Um, sort of think of it like night vision goggles. So it's creating more of a black and white image, but the ability to see in the dark um, versus our cone cells, which see color and function best in bright light. Um, so they have far more of the rod cells in their eyes, which makes them excellent, excellent hunters, even in the dark. And are they generally nocturnal? So they, they're technically crepuscular. So they are um, dusk and dawn generally. Um, but what's been interesting, uh, what's been interesting for me as I've observed more and more bobcats over the years is how often they are active during the day, actually, um, particularly mothers feeding kittens. So a mother bobcat will typically have a litter of two to four kittens. Um, they're born with their eyes closed, blind, totally helpless. Their eyes open after about a week and she will um, nurse them for roughly two months, but she will start bringing prey to them and start teaching them between three and five months to hunt. And so when the kittens are young, the mother is going out and feeding not only herself, but anywhere from two to four other small bobcats. And so they can't just limit their hunting time to the morning, uh, early morning and at dusk because they need to hunt more gophers and voles and um, rabbits to bring back quail uh, to their kittens. It, it's also true that um, in places where there are fewer people, they're more likely to be willing to go out during the day uh, because, again, they don't perceive the threat. But certainly um, crepuscular is, is their tendency. So when we see nature, well, I've got two two part question. One of them is, so how much would how much would a cat who does not have babies eat in a day? Would it eat like one vole a day or one prairie dog or would it eat three? I mean, I have no idea. You know, the last time I looked up a number, I want to say it was 10 pounds every couple days. I have to check that. But so, it's not so it's it's more than they they their preferred prey size is is small. It's you know one to five pounds. And so um they have to eat multiple so they have to eat multiple of those in that 
time frame. But the other thing about Bobcats is they can actually go for a relatively long period of time without eating. So they could, if they had a hunting uh, hunting area that was particularly productive, they might eat, I've watched one eat two or three things in you know the span of a day or an afternoon. Um, but if they had a day that was either um, for whatever reason, not a, they weren't able to leave their you know den area or um, they were unsuccessful in hunting because sometimes, you know, again, there aren't very many studies of bobcats because they're hard to find uh, and hard to sit with uh, for researchers and hard to tag and follow. But um, there are some studies and it's, you know, the success rate on their hunting is, you know, some somebody said it was 15 percent, um, somebody else I think it was in the low 20%, but you have to assume that every time they leap or lunge for a gopher, they're not getting the gopher. They're getting, you know, maybe one out of five. And, and then, so something like a mouse would be the equivalent of, I don't know, a couple spoonfuls of spaghetti to us, or it would be a snack. Yes. Yes. And do, I, I'm sorry if you already mentioned this, but do they also eat insects when they have to? Uh, generally not. Um, so they are, um, their preference is small mammals and they're willing to sort of go with whatever that is in a given area. So, um, in general, uh, it's like I said, gophers and bulls, um, rabbits. Um, so like cottontail, um, rabbits, um, out here in California, it's um, black tail jackrabbits, which are actually a type of hare. Um, in the East Coast, they actually will take deer. Um, so the, um, the diet is varied, but they are obligate carnivores. So they are looking for some form of meat. Um, birds, so ducks, quail, um, I've seen photos of a bobcat getting a seagull or a gull, excuse me. I always say seagull because I grew up saying seagull, but there are no seagulls. It's a gull. Um, so it, it varies, but I have not ever seen one eating an insect. I think a lizard would be kind of as far down that, um, that spectrum, but really their preference is for small mammals or birds. So kind of the question on eating was leading toward this, and this might be a weird question, but one of you know I said before that I see a lot of bears and one of the things I absolutely love is to see bears when they're not paying attention to humans and they mm -hmm. spend a lot of time just sitting around and nature programs really they make us think that predators do nothing but kill 24 hours a day and so my question is, do you have any idea how do bobcats spend most of their time? Do they just hang out? Do they walk? Are they spending all their time hunting? Oh, they're definitely not spending all their time hunting. So uh, they actually, you know, the phrase a cat nap, there's a fair amount of sort of lounging and snoozing that happens. Um, if they find in, depending on the weather and the temperature, either a cool spot in the shade or a nice spot in the sun, if they want to warm up, um, they will often just sort of recline. Um, they also, usually after they hunt, they groom. And so they'll sit and it's one of my favorite things to watch because a bobcat grooms like a domestic cat would groom. And so they lick their front paws and wash their face. Um, and it's really just magical to watch them. Um, but they, they groom just like a house cat and, um, and then often they'll, they'll nap and they will sit. I mean, the other thing about a bobcat hunting, which I think is different than many other predators is the patience. I often say that I would love to have the patience of a bobcat and the exuberance of a coyote because bobcats are incredibly patient hunters. They will find a gopher hole and sit basically motionless over it for 25 or 30 minutes just waiting for that gopher to pop its head up and they think they can lunge for it or leap into the hole and grab it. And so even when they're actively hunting, there's an enormous amount of time where they're motionless. So before we talk about threats to bobcats, um, I, mm -hmm. have, I have another perhaps unusual question, which is I know 
living with foxes also. Okay, so bears seem to poop indiscriminately. And foxes, I've noticed, and coyotes do too, often send messages with their poop. Um, Like if I put some sort of food out in the forest, oftentimes the fox will eat it and then poop in the spot. And I'm not sure what message. Maybe it's just like sealing a deal. Maybe it's – but. But there's definitely, or if I put something that stinks in the forest, um, some sort of aromatic compost, the foxes will poop on it. So my question is, well, either A, do bobcats send messages with poop, or B, just generically tell me about bobcat poop. Okay. Uh, So they do send messages with their scat, um, as do foxes uh, and coyotes. Um, So in terms of messages bobcats so I, I think i mentioned they are territorial and they're solitary and bobcats use their sense of smell more for social interactions than they do for hunting and when they are marking territory they have a couple of different ways they do it uh, they will mark with urine they'll mark with scat they have scent glands that they'll rub against brush um, so typically it marks a place um an area that they either are using as a hunting area or a a denning area uh, or just sort of, you know, along their territory if they want to make sure. So for coyotes, for example, if it's a well-used pathway, they often poop every time they go up or down the pathway to kind of remind everybody, hey, this is my, you know, uh, pathway. So, um, Go ahead. That's just the dogs barking at bears on the porch. Oh, you have a bear on your porch? Wow. <laughs> Lucky. Uh, so uh, so they do send messages um, with scent, and it's a way of um, continuing to mark the territory, um, sending a message to any other bobcats who might be in the neighborhood that that area, that hunting field, that denning spot is taken. In terms of their scat, because bobcats are obligate carnivores and eating meat, their scat is usually um, entirely filled with fur and bones. Uh, They basically, they don't really chew their prey. So bobcats kill with a bite, uh, usually to the back of the neck or the nape of the neck, um, some version of strangulation or breaking the spinal cord. And uh, they then will basically chew down, bite off chunks and or chew down, depends on the size of what they've uh, killed, and swallow it. So they're not actually chewing it. So uh, their scat is, you know, basically all the parts of a gopher uh, or a vole. Um, And unlike, so coyote scat tends to be also full of fur or hair, but, um, but twisted and with a tapered end and bobcat scat tends to be more in like a straight line, like a train on the tracks and uh, with a blunt end. Um, so before, Oh, before we go to threats, I have one more question, which is another strange question, which is I've heard rumors that shrews taste really bad and I will often see a shrew dead on the ground for several days when if I see a tiny, if I see a mole or some other, usually other food disappears in this forest overnight, but shrews can sit there for several days. Do they not like shrews or do we know? Uh, So I don't specifically know. I have heard that, um, that shrews have some sort of odor that they'll release and that they don't, therefore the predators think they don't taste good. I've never seen a bobcat take a shrew. so I would suspect that they probably don't like them because bobcats do have um, not quite as sharp a sense of smell as some other species, but a good sense of smell. So they would notice something that smelled bad. So let's leave off humans for a moment. And who – oh, no, no. Before we go there, I got another question, which is you talked about territoriality. And I've seen bears uh, have conflict – And the conflict is not nearly so scary as nature programs make it seem. It's usually a lot of gesturing, a lot of yelling, um, some wrestling. And I've seen a few bears with scars, but for the most part, it's not 
I mean, it's frankly a lot less scarier, a lot less scary than watching an MMA contest. Um, do bobcats, if they, if if you, if you drop a bobcat into somebody else's territory, um, or when a young bobcat is setting off to make new territory, are the battles pretty fierce, or are they, like I said, with bears, more a lot of gesturing? What, what, wait, before I go on, I was talking to a wolf expert who said that one of the primary killers of wolves is other wolves, that if a wolf goes into a new territory, the other wolves might kill it. But again, with bears, I'm usually seeing a lot of chasing off. Do you see what I'm asking? I do. Yeah. So um, I think with bobcats, and I've only seen this a couple of times, uh, again, bobcats are solitary and you very rarely see more than one bobcat together unless it's a mother with one of her young. But uh, when I have, it's, it's more noise than anything else. And maybe sort of, um, you know, when cats are in an aggressive posture, their ears will flatten back. And so it might be some loud yowling and one paw raised like it's going to sort of smack at the other. But it's not like a teeth and claws, two animals rolling in the dirt kind of battle. It's much more of a some version of uh, vocalization, ears flattened, you know, aggressive posture, possibly a smack of a paw and usually the other the the times I've seen it the other one runs off I mean it's a very you know I think many predators it's not worth the risk of life and the loss of energy that that battle would take um, if there's another spot they can go and hunt the gophers and voles in so uh, it it tends to not be a full-on MMA style physical confrontation so thank you for that and so um, leaving humans out of the picture who I'm thinking about a bobcat sort of sleeping in the sun and who does the bobcat have to worry about leaving humans off? Do, do mountain lions eat them? I know that, that grizzly bears can go after black bears. Um, so, so who, who would eat a, who would eat, who would kill whether or not they eat them? Who would kill a bobcat? Leaving humans off. Right. Yes. Leaving humans off. Uh, mountain lions will, I have seen a pack of coyotes chase off a bobcat, um, usually because they want the prey that the bobcat is going for and not so much because they want to kill the bobcat, but they could kill a bobcat. Um, And then that's really, other than humans, that's pretty much it except for kittens. So bobcat kittens are obviously more vulnerable and can be taken by foxes, coyotes, owls, eagles, or even sometimes a male bobcat will come in and kill uh, kittens that are not its offspring. And, okay, before we continue to humans too much, um, you said that bobcats are spread across the country. How have their numbers done uh, since conquest? Do we know, um, have, have they done okay in general or have their numbers been reduced as for example prey dog populations were reduced or did they just switch over to rats and cities so they have um they've definitely so this is a potentially very long historical answer uh but uh, okay (laughs) so um And first, I mean, this gets into a little bit the discussion around humans as a threat, but um, we want to get there uh, in a minute. Yeah. So I I won't go too far into that. But what I will say is that um, bobcats have generally they were widespread and the Native Americans did hunt them, but um, were judicious in their use and actually revered them as skilled hunters. And they had. Um, representations in myth and in religion uh, and were part of a community um, with all the other living things in their environment. And when the European settlers came to the to the North America and started pushing west, um, you know, one of the things in the United States, as um, as there was a westward expansion, it was draining swamps and clearing forests to build um, settlements and to create land for agriculture. And that led to habitat loss. Wait, before we go on, uh, you didn't mention beavers before and beavers were all over the place. Do bobcats eat beavers? Uh, Not that I know of. Okay, go ahead. 
They could, I suppose, but no, not that I'm aware of. Maybe the habitat would be tricky. Um, but actually, beavers is where I was going next because as as there was a westward expansion uh, and the Lewis and Clark expedition in particular, fur trapping um, and the that um, economic enterprise became very important um, in this country. And so there was actually a huge commercial fur trade in the U.S. and Canada. And um, the numbers are sort of staggering to me. Uh, in the 18th century, and unfortunately, most of the companies doing um, engaged in the fur trade didn't differentiate between lynx and bobcat. But in the 18th century, it was 750,000 lynx and bobcat. In the 19th century, so in the 1800s, it's estimated that it was 2.6 million lynx and bobcat killed in the commercial fur trade. And then between 1900 and 1960, it was estimated at 400,000. Um, and the numbers have gone up and down since then um, related to uh, both laws being passed, um, particularly Endangered Species Acts that protected other big cats um, because the fur trade, the bobcat, unfortunately, its fur was viewed as a replacement for some of the other big cats who were protected. And so there was actually a huge spike in the value of bobcat fur uh, pelts and an increase in the um, killing of bobcats. And so their numbers have fluctuated. And actually, in a number of states, um, in the Midwest in particular, they were either endangered or threatened in you know, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa. They were eradicated basically entirely from the state of Delaware. Um, and they have slowly been making a comeback in um, in those states, but um, but the westward expansion absolutely had an impact on bobcat populations, and it varied based on the location. The Midwest and some of the eastern states um, suffered precipitous declines in their bobcat populations. So before we go to more direct, you know, trapping and and discussions of that, I have a couple more questions. One of them is. Um, when I asked a grizzly, okay, so wolves can expand dramatically. You can have a wolf pack in Idaho, and then before you know it, you've got some outliers that made their way all the way to California. And I was asking a grizzly bear person if grizzly bears could make their way back from Yellowstone to California. And she said, yes, they can, but they expand differently, that, that a wolf will go a long, long ways and um, grizzly bears, usually the daughter will establish territory next to the mother. So they might expand 10 miles per generation. So it's very – it's it's sort of a, a block-wise expansion as opposed to swimming the Columbia River. And so do bobcats, when they do expand into a new territory or re-inhabit old territory, do you know how they expand? Like, Is it, is it more like wolves or more like – grizzly bears or something else entirely do you know what i'm asking i think so so i mean what i would say is that i think that how, how, how far, much do they when they make a new territory how far do they go that's the easy way to ask yeah that that's sort of what i thought you were getting at i think the short answer is only as far as they need to to have available prey so if they're in an area that they can only they could go you know five miles in one direction or another and be able to establish a territory that's, you know, as far as they'll go, you know, their lifespan in the wild is, you know, seven to 10 years at most. And so, um, it, there's kind of, depending on, you know, road mortality, natural causes, all sorts of other things, there's going to, there will be sort of a cycling of how many bobcats are in a given area as some are born and some die. And so, how far they have to go really is going to depend on how many other bobcats are in the area near where they've been born. I think my own personal experience watching bobcat kittens grow up and disperse um, is that they don't go all that far if the area will support it. Um, I've seen them stay relatively close to the den that they were born at um, if within that territory they can kind of parcel it out and have enough prey. So the real question then is, so when they're exterminated in Iowa, how 
how are they able to fill back in? And and have they filled back in okay in the states where they were either hammered or exterminated? Um, so I think they fill back in from the margins. Um, so the neighboring states, um, and that was true on the eastern seaboard and in the Midwest. They were, um, you know, pushing in from the other places where they had done better and not been pushed quite to the point of um, such low populations. Um, and um, you had a second part of the question, and now I forget what it was. I'm sorry. Oh, I think I did too. It's okay. Um, so <laughs> I, have, I have another question, and then and then we'll go to to trapping. And the other question is, when they reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone, it was a miraculous recovery of all sorts of other species because the wolves would uh, push the elk around. The elk had gotten really too lazy and were staying down in the river bottoms and harming the 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 bottom the the what's it called the oh the land next to the um, the riparian the, the, area the riparian area yeah so they were really harming the riparian area by getting lazy and also having too many and so the wolves yep. would push push them around so introduction of reintroduction of wolves helped trout for example and mm -hmm. reintroducing of beavers you know is a miracle for everybody and we know that with the extirpation of large carnivores in parts of the country, you know, deer have kind of run crazy, which then makes it really hard for ground dwelling birds, for amphibians. So when when the bobcats move back in, is there also a noticeable uh, improvement of the generalized health of the community? Do, do you see what I'm asking? I see what you're asking, and I'm actually not sure that there are really scientific studies that would show that, um, again, bobcats are far less studied than many of the other predators. What I would say in response to that, though, is, and this is a, sort of a philosophical uh, piece of the discussion, but there's a, a concept, I think, that's a very Western one of our environment as something to extract from, whether we're talking about minerals or plants or animals, and it's something that's there for the taking or the elimination or the eradication, depending on whether it's viewed as desirable or not. And, you know, the Native American view uh, and in other cultures would be that it's a very holistic all of this, all of the parts of the system impact all of the other parts of the system, and humans are part of that same system. And I think the ecological perspective, and it's one of the things that makes me the most excited about the um, next generation science standards, the new science curriculums, is teaching students uh, about an entire ecosystem and what happens when the number of prey or predators or a food source is impacted or the av availability of water um, because you can't, it, um, everything is balancing on everything else in that ecosystem. And so it, it's, it doesn't really matter what you take out or what you remove. You're always adjusting things above and below that. So by taking out or adding back medium to large size predators, you're always going to have an impact on smaller size animals and maybe even, you know, amphibians or plants that are otherwise being eaten by the animals that would be, you know, I mean, if the gophers are eating through the roots of a certain plant and the bobcats are there to control it, you know, there's, it, it's, it's such a complex analysis and it's very difficult. I mean, there really aren't accurate summaries of how many bobcats there even are currently in the U S I mean, I've looked and, um, you know, one study thought, you know, from years back, thought there was something around 700,000. Another more recent study, so one study said 700,000 to a million. Um, and then more recently, somebody else came out and said there's 2.4 to 3.5 million. That's a million dollar range in the number of bobcats in the country. And so I think it's very hard when people can't even figure out how many bobcats are in a particular area because they're elusive and rarely seen and they're hard to capture and you know put radio collars on i mean there's some great studies that have been done in ohio and texas and california but relatively few uh and often in places where there are large bobcat populations to begin with so you're not tracking them moving back in but i would say philosophically um, there's always going to be an impact when you introduce or remove any piece of uh, a healthy ecosystem 
That's great. Thank you for that. Um, I, I know I keep saying we're going to go to trapping now, but I'm going to do one more question <laughs> and then we'll do trapping, okay. which is okay. I've, I've read that you're originally from Massachusetts. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, so are there bobcats in Massachusetts now in like the especially the, the western part? Um, there are bobcats in Massachusetts. I've never seen one in Massachusetts, though. <laughs> but they do live there. They do. Yeah. Good. Um, OK, so uh, we have about um, 13, 14 minutes left. We, so we still have quite a bit of time. So can you talk about um, human uh, – I'm going to go completely value neutral here even though it breaks my heart – human interactions with bobcats? Um, sure. And the reason I'm saying not human trapping is because you mentioned uh, automobile accidents. So why don't yeah. you get car cars out of the way first and then after that talk about other threats to them by humans – and then talk about hunting and trapping. Okay, great. So unfortunately, uh, humans present a number of different threats to bobcats and collectively by far the greatest threat to the bobcats health and um, lives. So um, one issue uh, which relates to the traffic fatalities is development. So one of the things that happens as we expand our um, suburbs and our um, human communities, we are pushing further and further into bobcat territories. And that has a couple of different repercussions for bobcats. One is that we have roads that bisect their territories. And so the only way they can get from one part of their hunting territory, for example, to the water source that they might rely on, is to now cross a road. And when you have people who are driving fast, which unfortunately happens a lot, um, or distracted by a cell phone or other things, um, you end up with traffic fatalities. And bobcats will cross roads. They, unlike mountain lions, they generally will not cross freeways. So, you know, in California, where you have the eight lane freeways, the, the bobcats are not going to cross that, even though some of the mountain lions will. Um, but bobcats do cross roads. and um, I've seen it many times and it can be a very close call. I, I was a week ago photographing a bobcat as it was crossing the street towards my parked car and a car started kind of zooming around a corner from the other direction. And I had my arm out my window, basically waving at the driver to get them to slow down to make sure they didn't hit this bobcat. So it's, um, it's, it's definitely an issue. The other thing the roads do, though, is they create potentially genetic bottlenecking because depending on the size of the road and whether the bobcat's willing to cross it or not, they may not be able to go into different areas to find mates. And so you end up with these small groups of bobcats um, basically interbreeding and reducing the genetic variation that would otherwise have happened um, as they went out and looked for mates. So development is one risk. Another um, another risk or another issue um, is sort of the human emotional reaction to bobcats. And it's one that I find fascinating because bobcats sort of straddle this interesting middle ground. Many people have a fear of mountain lions um, and bobcats are regularly mistaken for mountain lions. A manager of a, a park in the East Bay here in the San Francisco Bay Area said that something like 30 to 40 percent of the mountain lion reports they got were actually bobcats. And so people sometimes fear bobcats and mistake them for mountain lions. They also sometimes mistakenly think that bobcats will um, attack and eat their pets. So if you go on next door or you read in the local paper, sometimes people say, oh, a bobcat was spotted in such and such neighborhood. You know, keep your keep your pets indoors or be aware. And certainly you should be a responsible pet owner and either keep them indoors or be outside with them so they're not prey to a variety of predators that might be in the neighborhood. But bobcats don't actually eat domestic animals. Um, they might get into a um, territorial dispute, especially if they were protecting kittens with a cat or a dog, but they don't eat them. Um, so there's a fear of bobcats. And then the flip side of it, which is actually just as bad and potentially more lethal for bobcats is that uh, people think they're adorable. And so people see bobcat kittens and want to take them in as pets or want to feed them. And um, 
the problem with that is that bobcats are, of course, wild animals and they make terrible pets. And so those cats often then get, quote unquote, re-released back by the person who thought they were going to keep it as a pet. And they can't survive on their own in the wild and end up being euthanized or taken to a a wildlife rescue center and used as an ambassador animal, but then confined basically for the rest of their life. Um, The same thing with animals that are fed. So it's true of, of other predators as well. But if you feed a bobcat, when it's a young kitten and it doesn't learn to hunt. Um, We had one here in Marin County that was at a trailhead and it was, and bobcats do not attack people. So even though there's a fear factor sometimes with some people about bobcats, they they don't attack people. But um, this bobcat was at a trailhead and it was scratching at, and in one instance kind of not really biting, but kind of nipping at the uh, hiking boot shoe of hikers that were going by. And so it ended up getting picked up by the Humane Society and taken to a wildlife rescue. And they were worried about whether it possibly had rabies or not. And then it turned out that the neighbors in the area acknowledged that they had been feeding the bobcat. And so when it got to the wildlife rescue, it was covered in fleas and ticks. It was emaciated, basically starving to death, and had been approaching humans for food. And in the end, it was euthanized so they could test it for rabies. So the people who thought they had this cute bobcat that they would just feed to keep it, for, you know, they liked having it come by their houses near this trailhead, it ended up causing the animal's death. So both human fear and human affection can actually be detrimental uh, to bobcats because people are killing them with kindness, so to speak. Another issue um, are things like mange, um, which is a mite that other predators also get that was originally introduced by humans in the 1900s to kill wolves and coyotes. And it causes itching for loss and can cause death. Um, One of the other things that's a huge threat to bobcats is rodenticide use. Um, Second generation anticoagulant rodenticides have significant impacts on a number of native predators and raptors, and uh, bobcats in particular have an an unusual reaction in that sometimes, recently, in fact, there's a story out of LA, both a bobcat and a mountain lion were found poisoned with rodenticides, but usually they don't consume uh, the prey that's been poisoned and then die themselves. It instead causes changes in their body, both increased inflammation and a suppressed immune response, and it makes them more vulnerable to other diseases like mange. Um, And there was a study of a number of bobcats in Southern California that actually were dying from mange, and it it basically was their systems had been so compromised by rodenticides that they were were dying from it. And um, when I talk about bobcats, I talk about the fact that they're exposed from, from basically in utero for their entire lives to rodenticides, because even when a bobcat mother is pregnant, especially bobcats living near urban and suburban areas, they're being exposed to these poisons every time they go hunt. And even if it doesn't kill them outright when they consume the rodents, it's in their systems and it's getting into the kitten systems as well. So those are all development, rodenticide, um, sort of human interactions, mange and disease. I would say Those are the main threats to bobcats, putting aside hunting, trapping, and wildlife killing contests, which would be on the other piece of their threats from humans. So we have about six or seven minutes left. So can you talk about those last three and and then also efforts to stop them? Sure. So uh, the laws vary from state by state. So um, we're fortunate here in California that trophy hunting of bobcats was banned at the end of 2019, but it's legal in 40 states. Bobcat trapping was banned in California in 2015, but it is legal in most states. And this is, again, for their fur. Um, Trapping um, is an issue that, um, again, varies very widely by states. Um, each state has its own rules or regulations or lack thereof in terms of what traps can be used, how often the traps have to be checked, and um, the desire to have a bobcat pelt um, for sale is is usually what motivates the trappers. From an economic standpoint, the states that have been successful in banning trapping 
it, the argument is that they're actually bobcats are actually worth more economically alive. Um, that ecotourism and wildlife viewing and um, the beauty of the uh, animal itself when it's alive in its natural environment generates more dollars in terms of uh, tourism and other things to a community than the value of a pelt, which, you know, depending on the, the year and the what state it comes from, could be $30, could be $250 or $300. Um, but it's a relatively modest amount compared to how much people would spend um, to travel someplace and get to see a bobcat. And then the last and um, just the most astonishing to me when I learned that these things even existed uh, are the wildlife killing contests. And uh, they are contests in which there are prizes given for killing the most and or the largest of the animals and the target animals in these uh, are typically coyotes, foxes, and bobcats. Um, some contests have other animals as well, but uh, those contests were banned in California in 2014 and Project Coyote is part of a nationwide coalition to outlaw these contests in every state. Um, we're very excited. Washington state just became the seventh state to ban wildlife killing contests. So um, it's gaining momentum and uh, hopefully that will continue and we'll end up with all 50 states are really, it's, you know, 43 to go. So um, coming back to trapping, you asked about efforts um, to stop or change, you know, um, trapping is in many of the traps uh, really cruel and inhumane in terms of the amount of suffering the animal has and the fact that people aren't required to check their traps regularly. And so an animal can suffer for days, not just hours, days um, in a trap. And um, there are groups like Wyoming Untrapped and Trapped, Trap Free uh, Montana, Trap Free New Mexico, um, in addition to organizations like Project Coyote that are working to um, eliminate trapping and certainly to the extent that there is trapping in the state's like, you know, places like Wyoming, where there's a cultural um, history um, to try and at least have some regulations around the types of traps used and the amount of time that passes before they're checked. Um, there are a number of states that, that no longer allow traps on public lands. Um, one of the things about wildlife trapping, not just bobcats, but others as well, is, is just how much damage it does, not just to the wildlife, but to um, people's pets. So um, domestic animals, dogs especially, often get caught up in these traps. Actually, small children end up injured by these traps as well. So um, the trapping is, in addition to inhumane and economically not um, not the best option in terms of the value of the bobcat is in its, in its life, in its role in that ecosystem. Um, but also there's a lot of um, other damage done by the traps. So before we close, is there anything else you want to say about either bobcats or or killing of bobcats or attempts to stop? And then I'm going to ask about, I've got one final a wind down question on how people can help. Is there okay. anything else you want to say? Anything that I haven't given you opportunity? You no, know, I mean, I think the, the pitch or the plea that I would have for people is, um, to hopefully, and, and what's interesting for me doing this podcast interview is normally when I speak, I have my photography. So I, I have a very visual presentation and photos of cat, bobcats and kittens. And, um, but I would encourage people to um, learn more about them and, um, and also to hopefully it inspiring a love that will then protect them. Um, but whether it's bobcats or foxes or coyotes or owls, um, rodenticide use is the thing that, I mean, everybody can play a role in, not not using them, not hiring companies that use them. They are um, decimating all sorts of native predators and raptors, um, owls. There's a great group, Raptors Are the Solution, that in addition to Project Coyote is working. Um, California has a ban on rodenticides that is sitting on the governor's desk waiting for Governor Newsom to sign it. Um, and so I would say that one of the things that people can do is just educate themselves. Um, and if they're motivated to try and help, 
um, a ban on rodenticides is uh, is a huge, huge win for wildlife. So two things. One is how can people, and thank you for that, how can people uh, support Project Coyote and also how can people uh, see your see your wildlife photography and support your work? So um, Project Coyote has um, a website, projectcoyote.org, and there's a ton of resources on their website. So there are um, some really great webinars. Um, and I say that even though I was one of those webinars, but some of the others, the ones I've watched, they're really, they're amazing about wolves. There's an upcoming one. Um, Joanna Lambert is doing one about um, coyotes and fear and predators, which I think is going to be super interesting. Um, so there's um, ways to get involved. I think one of the things, Project Coyote is a small organization, but really nimble and efficient. And if you get in their, um, their pack, if you get on their email list, the action items for people are so easily done. They give you the contact information. They give you some sample language if you want to email your representatives um, on various issues. And it's a great way to um, have impact and also not expend a lot of effort. The other thing I would say is that um, Project Coyote has a Keeping It Wild program, which is part of what I'm involved in. And we've designed some classroom curriculum. So there's um, like presentations, there's book lists divide up, divided up by grade level, um, fiction and nonfiction books, um, which as everyone is distance learning or homeschooling or um, something like that. Um, there's great materials on the website. So I encourage people to go to projectcoyote.org and check all of that out. Um, my photography is on Instagram. I'm at SK Wildlife Photos. And uh, my website is, as you said at the beginning, www.sarahkillingforth.com. My bio is on the Project Coyote website because I am a wildlife educator there. And I recently did a Notes from the Field blog interview that's also on the Project Coyote website, and that includes some of my photography as well. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Sarah Killingsworth. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>